Hello everyone and welcome to another conversation with Ned Group's Ned Group Investments. Today I'm speaking to Tony Cousins, who's the CEO and Portfolio Manager at Perfect International, who are based out of London. The Perfect team manage the Ned Group Investments Global Cautious Fund, which is the low-risk multi-asset fund in the Ned Group Investments Global Range. The Global Cautious Fund is a stable growth vehicle aiming to deliver a stable stream of real returns in excess of cash. The fund achieves this through a low weighting to equity and a high allocation to fixed income. The fund is, is ideal for an SA investor seeking to take money offshore but wants to limit downside risk or is looking to reduce risk exposure to equity markets. Tony, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad you've made it through the broken undersea cable. Um, no problem, Doug. Good to be here. And uh, Tony, I guess the first question is, you know, you've mentioned that you've been hiding in a cave for the past year. You've had 72% of this particular fund uh, invested in sovereign bonds. But after the recent rout in equity markets, you've increased equities for, for the first time in, in almost two years. Um, can you take us through this decision? Uh, sure. Yeah. I um, mean, as you're, as you're saying, we've been hiding in the cave. We're a value manager. Um, and we felt for uh, some time that equities were extremely overvalued. Um, you know, this is what happens. They're not, not the only class that's, uh, asset class that's overvalued. Um, a fixed income uh, was as well. And this is simply what happens when you have central banks spending a decade printing $15 trillion of new money. It has chased um, equities to um, excessive levels of valuation. Um, and uh, as a value manager, um, or, you know, it's always interesting to speculate as to what the catalyst will be. But what we do know is that when equities are that expensive, they are vulnerable. Um, and I think uh, in this situation, it was exacerbated because so much of the, um, uh, the growth that we've seen uh, was driven by debt, uh, particularly in the U.S., uh, with a lot of debt being raised for uh, stock buybacks. Now, I mean, let me say, first of all, there's nothing wrong with stock buybacks, provided they are made out of cash flow. However, the problem here uh, was that uh, a lot of the stock buybacks were financed uh, out of balance sheet, simply raising debt to buy back stock. Um, and this is akin to borrowing money to pay the dividend. Um, if a company did that, they'd be pilloried. Uh, but they got away with it with um, with stock buyback. So um, we were faced uh, with a market which was extremely overvalued. So we reflected that by only having a 25% weighting um, in equities. Uh, sure enough, the coronavirus has come along. It's um, uh, effectively stopped economies in their tracks, and um, the equity market has reacted very violently on the downside. Um, uh, to this because they're aware of some of the structural problems and the over indebtedness of um, many parts of the, the world economy and are fearful uh, as to um, how that will affect um, the abilities of companies to, to come through this. Um, now, uh, we're, as I said, we're a value manager and we took the decision following the first round of uh, falls uh, that it was time to ease into um, equities. Uh, obviously, we have a headroom uh, on uh, this particular um, uh, strategy up to 40%. And that's a maximum we can put into equities. Um, uh, so we only went in uh, to the tune of um, uh, 5%. Um, we don't try and guess the bottom uh, here at Perford, uh, but the essence of this strategy from an asset allocation point of view is to lean into the asset class as it gets cheaper. Now, I'll just sort of say a little bit more about where we put that money. Um, because we have been concerned about the U.S. equity market being significantly more overvalued than um, non-U.S. equity markets, um, and because they'd uh, fallen to a similar extent when we made this decision, we decided to put all the money into non-U.S. equity markets. Um, so that uh, valuation discrepancy had persisted uh, and uh, non-US equities clearly offered better value. So that's where we put the first 5% uh, of the fund. And obviously with the fall in financial markets, we've literally seen a rush to cash on US cash in particular. Um, but we do talk about four drivers to return for this fund. Um, and those are asset allocation, security selection, 
duration positioning and currency management. Um, how have each of these particular drivers performed um, over the last year, particularly with this drawdown? And have you seen asset classes perform in a way that, that, that you would expect? Uh, well, equity certainly performed uh, as we expected. So I think it was good that the uh, portfolio had a very low weighting um, to equities. Uh, and, uh, you know, we never know what's going to make equities repriced, but they uh, they always do when they're that overvalued. So they have repriced uh, and ha having a, a low weighting to equities um, uh, was good. Um, in, in terms of the duration of the bond portfolio, uh, we have maintained very short duration um, in the bond portfolio. We only invest in sovereigns uh, and high quality sovereigns and liquid sovereigns um, at that. Now, again, after 15 years of printing money, um, yields uh, had been chased down to, uh, to our minds from absurdly low levels. Um, and uh, the problem was it was just impossible to uh, make a decent rate of return um, uh, in these bonds because the yields were simply the wrong number. In real terms, uh, they were um, uh, negative to the tune of 1 to 2 percent. Um, and that compares uh, starkly with the last bear market in equities when long uh, government bonds were offering you a 5 percent positive uh, real yield. Um, so we took the view that um, uh, Long duration bonds simply uh, did not offer you a decent uh, rate of return, um, and so we kept the portfolio in uh, very short duration bonds. Now, um, yields continue to go down. This is clearly a, a very significant demand shock. It's deflationary, and the markets initially reacted uh, by pushing yields lower. Clearly, if we'd had more duration in the portfolio, we could have made more money. Uh, but our bonds uh, uh, still produce a sort of small positive return uh, in equity markets, which had fallen by uh, by more than 20% 20, uh, 20%. So they were uh, indeed a safe haven. Now, since governments have announced um, uh, absolutely enormous rescue pa packages, we have seen um, those low points in bond yields retreated from. Uh, yields have gone back up again and again. Um, uh, short duration would have protected the portfolio um, uh, during that bouncing, bouncing yields. Um, in, in terms of stock selection, uh, our stocks have um, performed well. Um, we uh, invest in value and quality equities. Key characteristics of the portfolio are high dividend yield, uh, high return on equity, but very importantly, uh, very low debt to equity. Um, and studies of previous bear markets and equities show that uh, what you need to avoid are companies uh, with high levels of debt, uh, and those companies have clearly been punished um, uh, very severely um, in this downturn. So we have protected um, the portfolio um, in that respect. Um, uh, I guess the one area that hasn't uh, worked uh, as well as we would have hoped was the currency exposure, um, we manage this within a 0 to 45% uh, risk parameter, and we were up towards the upper end of this level because uh, the tool we use, purchasing power parity, indicated that the dollar um, was uh, very significantly overvalued. Uh, in the early stages of this crisis, um, as often happens at times of panic, there was a flight to safety, flight to the US dollar, which took it to even more overvalued uh, levels, um, and, and clearly that was a, a weight on the uh, performance of the fund. Um, since the, the Fed has announced um, huge monetary stimulus in, in, in terms of um, a, another massive quantitative easing program, um, and they're sort of therefore supplying more dollars to the market, we have seen a, a, a pullback. But at its height, um, uh, the US dollar against a currency like sterling was more than 40% overvalued. And that really is a, an extreme level of overvaluation in terms of uh, purchasing power parity. Uh, so in, just in answer to your question, um, uh, a lot of things worked. Not everything worked. Um, but uh, you know, the, the key here is to keep employing a process. This is a strategy we have been running. Um, uh, since the early 90s, um, it has been very successful in generating 
good real rates of return with low volatility, and that has been by relentlessly applying that four-pronged value and quality-driven process, and that is what we will continue to do. And I think what's quite interesting about the perfect profit process is that you don't have any credit in your in your portfolios. Anything you do invest in is sovereign bonds, and you've mentioned that there. And I guess when we look at the markets now, um, uh, it's it's maybe just a, a a point to maybe tease out a bit more is is is, is as to why you don't invest in in credit um, and some of the reasons for that. Sure. Uh, well, I guess there's, there's two things. One was valuation, but the main reason is liquidity. I mean, we don't invest in credit because um, it's very, very easy to buy uh, these bonds in the good times. Um, uh, however, liquidity simply evaporates uh, in the bad times. These are unlisted assets, um, uh, and uh, there has been a massive amount of issuance um, uh, of, um, of, of credit uh, over the last a decade, you know, if you print $15 trillion worth of new money uh, and make it incredibly cheap and, and plentiful, then companies will borrow it. And that's precisely what's what's happened. Um, and corporate debt to GDP is at an all-time high, uh, surpassing the levels of 2000 and 2008. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, and uh, these bonds have been issued and sold um, uh, around the world. Um, uh, now, uh, what you have seen uh, as a result of uh, this crisis is a major spike in credit spreads. Um, uh, corporate bond triple B spreads went from 1.5% uh, uh, to 4.5%. Um, uh, high yield spreads went from uh, about 4.5% to 8.6%. And that just reflects some of the stress that exists uh, in this market. At those low levels of spreads, you know, those you simply weren't being compensated for the risk you, you were uh, being taken. But uh, the sh very rapid rise in those spreads just it indicates just how little liquidity uh, there is um, in, in this market. Uh, and I think just you know the the um, the hot spot here really is U.S. Um, uh, corporate credit, U.S. mortgage credit as well, um, because uh, as unlisted assets, these rely on investment banking market makers. And because of a regulation known as the Volcker Rule, um, which is really a remnant of the uh, the last crisis when uh, banks used to bet the ranch uh, on um, in, uh, with proprietary capital, the Volcker Rule restricted uh, proprietary capital on investment banking ba uh, balance sheets. Uh, and what this, uh, you know, one of the in unintended consequences of this is a, a severe reduction in market making capacity. In these bonds, so what would ordinarily be a very illiquid market during times of crisis has really seen this um, sort of triply a a exacerbated by that absence of, um, uh, of liquidity in the markets, and uh, um, uh, I think that's why the, the falls have been very, very sharp. And in some areas of the market, there was only one buyer, and that is the Fed. Yeah, and we have seen the Fed um, elicit the help of BlackRock, um, who I guess are advising to buy the BlackRock ETFs. Um, <laughs> what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on, that, on, on the Fed's uh, ability to influence um, economic growth through, through some of this monetary stimulus? Have they reached the end? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, cl clearly in terms of interest rate policy, uh, uh, the Fed had a bit more room than other central banks because it had the highest interest rates going into this, but that was exhausted in no time whatsoever. Um, you know, the, on average, a post-Second World War recession has acquired a, a little over 400 basis points of interest rate easing um, to uh, stimulate growth, and nobody had 400 basis points. Uh, the ECB in Japan had negative interest rates. The Fed was 1.75. Bank of England was a little under one. So no one had that sort of interest rate uh, ammunition. So really, the Fed's impetus here has been in another round of, um, of money printing, quantitative easing. And I think we've seen a subtle change here. Um, uh, we now are seeing effectively direct monetization uh, of uh, government debt uh, issuance. Um, uh, and you're seeing coordinated fiscal and monetary policy. We've seen some absolutely enormous 
uh, fiscal stimulus packages uh, coming up, the U.S. coming up with one little over two trillion dollars, and uh, you know a lot of those bonds will be bought by the Fed um, because uh, uh, you cannot have a failed auction. You cannot have a failed Treasury auction um, uh, because that would massively spook uh, the market. So, uh, you know, I, I think th this is the right thing to do, um, and it's the right thing to do from a fiscal point of view. And in order to make sure those bonds get away, it's the right thing to do from a monetary point of view. But this is going to leave a hangover. Uh, you're going to see enormous increases in uh, government debt to, to GDP, um, uh, and some from already very high levels. And you know, whilst this is a conversation for another day, eventually we're going to get to how do we get out of this hole? Um, and uh, you know, that's a very very tough uh, question to. To answer, but for now, I don't think the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England really had any option but to step up to the plate and print more money. And Tony, I guess the, we, we've spoken a lot about a lot about the past and around some of the drives of performance in the fund, and the fund has held up exceptionally well um, despite some of the drawdowns in um, in due to due to currency movements. Um, I think just month to date, we're down 3.95%. Uh, whereas our, the global peer group is down 7.5 and the ACRI is down 14.7. So clearly the fund is protected. Um, you have increased equities. Uh, and I guess the next question is, you know, if we, if we look forward now and we say, well, will Perford increase the equity allocation going forward? And what, what, what type of environment are you, are you waiting for um, in order to do that? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I think you know what we do is we set trigger points, um, predetermined based on uh, our assessments of, of value. Um, the the core concept we use is what we call the value indicator, which is dividend yield plus sustainable growth in dividends forecast over a five year uh, time period. Now we translate those into market levels. We set those trigger points within Bloomberg, and uh, when they are hit, um, we will. Uh, everybody in the investment strategy committee receives an email. Uh, saying they've been hit, and we have to convene a meeting within 24 hours to decide what we're uh, going to do about it. Um, and you know that's what happened when we increased the equity weighting uh, by uh, five percentage points. We have um, uh, renewed, we we'll put in new trigger points, uh, which are lower than where we are now. Uh, and if they are hit, we will buy um, uh, more equities. And you know this is the importance of process uh, again. Um, you don't have to wait for the news to look good. You have to wait for better value to come along, and um, I think I've, uh, you know, had this conversation with with some of your investors um, in the past, and when I've been down in um, South Africa, that um, you know, if you look at the three best buying opportunities over the last 50 years, they were 1974, 1982, and 2009, and the economic news was universally bleak at those times, uh, but you had to have the a discipline of process to go and buy uh, equities when they got to those good value levels, and that is what we've always done in this strategy, and that is what we will uh, do again. So, um, you know, for some markets, those uh, triggers of good value are, you know, some way off now. Um, the, the level for the uh, the S and P 500 is below um, uh, 2,000, and it's obviously well above that uh, uh, so far. But uh, uh, for other equity markets, so uh, we are much closer to those. Um, so that's what we're watching, and uh, when trigger points are hit, we will buy more equities. Mm. And Perford have done exceptionally well in, in previous big economic downturns. Um, you only have to look at your performance of your uh, GBP mandate um, in 2002, 2008, uh, 2016, uh, to see just how well the strategy has protected capital. And we have obviously seen this coming through again. Um, Tony, thank you very much for taking time away from the desk to facilitate this call. And I trust everyone has found this conversation useful. Uh, I would draw your attention to a number of podcasts with the perfect team that we've conducted and a one page one page notes commenting on the fund's recent performance which is accessible on Ned Group Investments website or through your sales consultant um, and again thank, thank you for joining us and um, we wish you the best of luck for the rest of the lockdown thank you very much okay thanks so much Doug thank you